Hello, and welcome again to Listening to the Wind, uh, the IWSA weekly interview series. And I'm really pleased to be sitting down with Greg Johnson, who's the founder and CEO of Advanced Wing Systems Limited over in Australia. He is responsible for the commercial side of the company, as well as the technical systems design. Greg holds an engineering degree and an MBA. He's been involved in the development of the SRW system since its inception, and he's sitting in South Africa at the moment, I believe. So welcome to Listening to the Wind, Greg. Thank you very much, Kevin. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing about your your adventures over in South Africa and all about the system. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, uh, close myself down and I'll start up the slideshow in a moment. So here we go. Uh, can you can you see that, Greg? Yes, we probably want to go to full screen on that. Yep. So see all the slides down the front. Absolutely. So here we go. Okay. Very good. Okay, so um, let me introduce Advanced Wing Systems. Advanced Wing Systems is a uh, small company based out of Perth in Western Australia. We've been involved with wing sail technology for about 30 years. So if we roll on to the next slide, Gavin, we'll talk a little bit about the history of the, the company. We, we first started with putting prototypes of our wing sail design onto sailing yachts, um, initially an 18 foot skiff in 1986. Um, progressed onto a number of other vessels. At that point, really the material science and um, sail making technology and so forth were really not there quite for being able to really deploy these things widely. So we sailed them ourselves for a number of years. When the 33rd America's Cup came around and Olingi um, was beaten so convincingly by Oracle um, BMW, uh, that elevated wing sails back onto the um, table for yachting generally. Um, we've always had an interest in applying the technology to wind assisted shipping and had investigated that in the 80s around about the time that the fuel prices crashed. So since, since 2012, we've undertaken quite a lot of computational fluid dynamics modeling, um, built a number of prototypes on a number of vessels, participated in uh, supplying IP to the US America's Cup team for the last America's Cup challenge. And we're currently in South Africa fitting a 70 square meter wing to a 45 foot, eight ton cruising yacht. Next slide. So we have a strong sailing background um, with ocean racing experience, America's Cup experience. We've got within our team, we've got seaborne shipping experience and ship loading experience. We've got engineering, naval architecture and shipwright skills. As I've said previously, we've got three decades experience with wing sails um, and an emphasis, very strong emphasis on practical operational aspects. Um, so aerodynamic performance is important, but it should not be at the expense of practicality. And really for something to work, it first must, for something to work well, it first of all must work. Next. So I think the operational barriers for wind assistance are reasonably well understood and they've been um, noted by a number of, of people who've studied this, but things like visibility obstruction, cargo handling, air draft constraints, uh, the crew safety, crew training, structural integrity, stability and heel. And 
these are all aspects of the wing sail design which must um, remain paramount regardless of what the air can, uh, of the aerodynamic performance of the system. Next. So our solution to this is what we call the semi-rigid wing. Um, it's technology which is we've proven in yachting. Um, as I said, we've worked with the New York Yacht Club America's Cup, um, Amer American Magic America's Cup team, and we're now installing it on cruising catamarans. We've, it's a simple, lightweight construction. It uses a flat membrane technology which reduces the production costs and improves the stowage and durability of the system. So the, the SRW combines aerodynamic efficiency with good um, operational characteristics. Uh, it, it can be collapsed to a very small footprint. Um, so you have minimal impediment while, while loading, low height at harbour, low um, loads while at dock. Um, we get very good lift and drag coefficients from the from the system and we have options to fit additional high lift devices to enhance the lift. Um, and uh, you know we can see performance out of the system which is is uh, the same as multi-element um, rigid wing systems. The operation can be fully automated um, and where we're going with the shipping is into a full modular design that effectively has a ISO container footprint and supports a business model, which is a module is always removed from the ship for maintenance and replaced with another working one and can be done pretty much at any place where a container port or a container can be delivered, uh, which means that there's no special skills required for docking uh, dockside maintenance. So with the um, shipping operations and maintenance velocity, it's, it's, as we've said, it's an emphasis on, on operations, uh, fully automated, self-collapsing in the event of energy loss and say dead ship, um, integrated into route optimization um, and economic optimization, um, no additional crew requirements, uh, no, uh, interference with ship loading and low visibility impairment when stowed. And so that's really the philosophy that we've adopted for the, the where we're going into the shipping environment. Okay, so where we are at the moment is um, we're trialing the system in leisure yachting. Uh, we've that we consider to be a, an important demonstration market um, and we've got existing products for the, the rapidly growing sort of cat catamaran sector um, so yep just just excuse me a second Um, yep, sorry, excuse me, just getting a little uh, muddled on my slides here. So we, we've been engaging with vessel builders to provide um, a version of this, which is effective a standard offering for their boats. Um, the first installation is done. It's a 72 square meter wing on a 13.5 meter, eight ton catamaran. Uh, that catamaran also has a hydric, 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 sorry, hybrid electric propulsion with uh, regeneration capacity. Um, and we're in soon to embark, uh, as in the next few days, on a sea voyage from South Africa to Europe on that vessel. We have orders for about six systems, and we should be scaling production of the, the, that system to 10 per annum by the end of 2021.
So a little bit about that vessel. Um, as I said, it's a 13.5 metre, 8,000 kilogram cruising catamaran, hybrid, hybrid electric drive system. It's a 72 square metre wing. The total rig weight on the vessel is 430 kilograms. Um, it has reefing capability. We've got two reef points into that system. Um, the boat is currently under commissioning and will be released by the end of this week. Um, what this is giving us is, is the opportunity to test the systems on a long journey and record a lot of information about the power and the regeneration capacity of the wing. So there's a couple of photos here of the vessel um, with the first with the, the wings stacked down on the boom. When we go into the shipping environment, we have a um, roll of furling system, which will neatly stack um, the system. Uh, it's quite a unique system. I won't go into the details of it because it's still subject to patent applications. The second photograph there is just a photograph looking up the wing when it's set. Um, and the third, just a view from the leeward side of that wing. This, this variant of the wing is actually directly applicable to the small shipping market. And that's really the next target market for us is to move into the um, inter-island cargo, general cargo vessels, particularly in places like the South Pacific. Um, we, we have a conceptual rig developed for that, which is um, around about 66 square metres in, in size. and incorporates crane derricks and can be folded back for um, to reduce windage in in hurricane seasons and so forth. Um, in, in the larger ship development, we're seeking industry partners. We're doing design to do design studies and industry consult consultation to refine refine the concept. Um, detailed design of key components so do bench testing of the key components move on to full design and then uh, into prototype development so if you need to get hold of us there's some contact information here Okay, thank you very much, Greg. Really interesting presentation. Thanks. And yeah, we were coordinating that a little bit across across quite a few thousand miles, so there wasn't too much delay. Um, now, I'm, yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit on the <laughs> on the yeah, internet here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I don't, I don't know. I think I think England's maybe creaking a little bit as well. Um, I picked up a you know a, a number of things from that presentation, but the things that kept coming through were you know the the practical operation of this of this system. You know that I, I loved your expression. It, it works only if it works. You know that that commercial application is just as yeah. important, if not maybe more important than the than the actual uh, the the wing itself. If it won't operate in a commercial uh, situation then there's no point in developing it. So, so my brother, who's the, the partner in the business with me, has a lot of experience in um, ship loading and seaborne on ships. And you know, the environment for these things is, is not friendly. Um, you, know, you, you have to think through the whole process of things like, how do you exclude dust from it while you're loading? If you're loading something like wheat or um, any uh, powders products, then if you're not excluding dust from the system while you're loading, it's just going to get full of dust. Um, how is it going to get hosed down? How is it going to get uh, treated when it's at dock? Um, all of those things have to be paramount in the design of the system. Otherwise, it will not be adopted by ship users. Yeah, no, that, that is, uh, it's absolutely true. And I, and I think, you know, the, uh, the focus on modulization um, is, is a really interesting one. We've heard this from a number of companies, but still, still work to be done there. 
but the containerization allowing for maintenance and that type of thing. Um, you know, yeah, how, I think how do you it's see that working? Challenges. Mm. Well, I think it's one of the big challenges in where, where the engineering design must come together with the practical requirements because um, I mean, the way we envisage this happening is that we, we kind of break the system into a plant room, which would be a 40 foot ISO container, container size. Um, we and then we have a double height 40 foot ISO container that actually contains the wind. Um, and the whole system is completely self-contained within that um, those two modules, um, and will stack within that and close up within that and can be air pressurized within that to exclude dust, etc. Um, and then the idea being is that it's leased to the ship owner rather than sold to the ship owner, and remove the, the capital purchase requirement from ship. Ship ownership is a complex environment. You know, typically the first owner has a ship for eight years and after that each owner owns it for four years. Yeah. Um, but, so you look at something like a four year, year lease cycle um, where there's no capital required up front by the, the owner or the operator and they're often different people. Um, it, we can provide a system which which can be installed and when requires maintenance you literally lift the iso container size modules off the ship and replace them and send the the other ones back to a centralized uh, maintenance facility where they're refurbished and ready to put onto another vessel yeah. so the the vessel owner doesn't own the kit the they lease the kit and they're provided with kit that works. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think I think it's that shift to the to the opex um, that can really unlock the door on on kind of scaling scaling things or replicating this across the industry. On that point, which of the sectors? I mean, we saw uh, the picture in the presentation of a Volca um, of the large vessels. Um, which are the main, which are yep. the main sort of markets or main sectors of, of shipping that you're, you're focusing on? Well, initially, we will focus on the small inter-island general cargo type vessels. So, you know, 90 to 150 metres sort of thing. Yeah. Um, one reason being is that we can deploy technology we already have they have different crewing requirements they have different operational requirements they're often um, operating in environments where infrastructure is is limited um, so having a system which is not dissimilar to what we're currently deploying on the cruising catamarans um, is makes sense for those types of environments so it can be they can be stayed rigs they can they can require a little bit of crew input because typically these boats have crews and they're used to handling these types of things. Mm -hmm. And then if we can incorporate things like crane derricks into the system so that we um, get better value out of the asset, then that's a good entry market into the shipping environment for us. Um, dry bulk is, is yeah. probably, yeah, dry bulkers is probably the next place to go. Um, but before we get there, we will we we've got we've got to build up one the asset base of the business and the cash flow of the business, um, and probably uh, extend our partnerships and raise some capital to do that because it's not a cheap exercise. No, indeed, indeed. And um, now I think that you know that that smaller that smaller ship market. I mean, you've got a lot of flexibility there as well. You've got a lot of different types of vessels, so I'm, I'm sure you're going to be building up a lot of experience as you're as you're uh, putting these on various different vessels and various different operational uh, platforms. Um, is is the plan to, yes, to monitor these systems um, as as you deploy them? Uh, you're going to keep monitoring these going forward. Yes, yeah, so we, when we go into that environment, and, and in fact, this is something we're actually moving to in the cruising catamaran environment as well, is the full automation of the system, and then 
uh, full data recording off the system as well. Um, and when we're going into vessels like the one we are at the moment, which has a, a, an ocean vault hybrid electric drive system, uh, we also have the opportunity to collect a lot of power information from the vessel as well. So um, we can build up things, things like resistance curves and we can build up regeneration, um, motor sailing characteristics. Um, even in, in the few test sails we've done with the, the rig on this boat, we're seeing some very, very impressive uh, performance while motor sailing. Um, right. You know, needing only a very, very small amount of wind to drop the power requirement from the engine plant quite significantly. Yeah, no, I, I can imagine. And I think this is an important aspect. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, I'm going I'm to sort of widen the focus out a little bit. And uh, as we mentioned at the top of the top of the show, you, you're in South Africa at the moment. You're based over in Australia. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the developments currently are underway in Europe. And I think you have some experience in Europe as well. So first of all, I just want to get a, a, an idea or, or some comments about the, the way that sail cargo or, or wind propulsion for commercial shipping is being viewed in Australia, maybe some insights in South Africa. Um, are you seeing any differences? Um, uh, you know, is, is the market opening up a little bit? Look, I think the short answer is probably no. Um, I think the general awareness is low. I mm -hmm. think the the commercial impetus at the moment is fairly low. Um, and I, I think governments in both of those countries are not really focused on this as an area where they would want to actually um, have any input or any policy uh, around as well. Um, and, you know, I know less about the government in South Africa than the one in Australia, but the one in Australia seems to be uh, doing everything they possibly can to undermine um, the moves to decarbonisation. Um, and I think what we need to see is, is some policy changes. I think commercial imperatives will drive it and they won't come from these or these countries they'll come because these countries are highly dependent on seaborne trade uh, you know australia has around about 95 percent of its trade is seaborne yeah. um, so once the commercial imperatives are forced upon the people who are carrying their cargo then they will react to it but um I wouldn't take one breath now and expect to hold it until something happens. <laughs> that's that's a good that's a good way of putting it. Um, what uh, you, you mentioned about the commercial imperatives, and I think I think you're absolutely right. I think it, in in many ways all regulation is is driven that way. You know, until there is a commercial imperative, it's it's quite unusual to have that regulation going in front. But I I, do, I completely understand what you're saying. What what steps could be taken? um to perhaps increase that awareness or increase that uh uh the drivers there in over in australia then. Uh, look i think moves by the OM, imo recently i think are good they will put the pressure back onto the shipping industry which does a lot of business with australia um i you know i think a move by the US back into uh, the climate arena um, is going to help raise pressure because they will they they, they will step up alongside the EU for um, doing these types of things. And at, at the end of the day, if you're trading with these places, you will be forced to follow their rules. Um, and I think that's how countries like South Africa and Australia will ultimately be forced to move in those directions. I think, you know, as we see carbon pricing, um, we see, you know, commercial impediments being put in place for um, dirty ships, then the 
the ship owners will ultimately move that way. The governments will follow. Hmm. Now, that's a fair, I, I think that's a fair comment. Um, now, coming back to wind propulsion in particular, um, you know, do you see that there are um, any significant sort of safety, engineering or technical barriers that are still existing around the application of wind propulsion into commercial shipping? I, look, I don't think so. I think wind, and we're seeing some really quite innovative things, you know, as you're well aware of, coming out now. And I think that the engineering, the safety, the integration into the ship, crew training, et cetera, can all be dealt with reasonably well. Um, at the end of the day, this, you know, as we've emphasised, the system has to work in that dirty industrial environment, which is a ship. Um, but I think from an engineering perspective and from the perspective of systems design, those things are all possible. I think we're struggling more with just a level of awareness of how much energy the wind can provide. Um, people would seem to rather spend a lot of capital getting uh, one and a half percent improvement by mucking around with their propeller than getting 15 or 20 or 30 percent improvement by putting the same capital into uh, something which harnesses the wind. Yeah, and I think I think there is a, a sort of misconception, and I, I, I see this uh, completely. Uh, I, I'm dumbfounded by the speeds that are generated in the in the racing yacht world. You know, where you're going to even up yeah. to three times <laughs> the speed of the wind. Um, that heading you know, for Paul. Yeah, oh, right, right, unbelievable. You know, yeah. but uh, there's there's still a perception in in the world for for the layman, and I put myself in in that, that field as well, that you're pushing the boat. When, you're, when the wind is coming to the sail, it kind of captures the wind and you push the boat in that way. But of course, wing sails don't yeah. work that way. Well, the, the latest America's Cup boats are a pretty good example because the difference in their apparent wind angle from upwind to downwind is about five degrees. Hmm. Um, they sail upwind when they're going downwind. <laughs> um, now, you're not likely to see that in a in a 65,000 ton vessel that's cruising at 14 knots. However, there's a lot of the time when, because they are effectively motor sailing all of the time, uh, the apparent winds are forward along a lot of the time, and with apparent winds forward and, and on the beam, you can generate uh, very good propulsion from a, a wing. Mm. Um, and yeah, it, it's, we're seeing, yeah, we're literally in two or three knots of breeze, we're seeing a 40% reduction in the engine power required to push the catamaran through the water. Yeah, which is, which is really significant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's huge. It, it, it's a. It's actually a little surprising, but mm. <laughs> well, I, I like. I like surprises. I like those sort of surprises. <laughs> yeah, yeah me too. Um, okay, now we're going. We're going to. We're going to move into the quick fire Q and A. So I'm just going to ask you. You know, uh, maybe not. Maybe not single answer, Single word answers, but very short, clipped answers, if you would. And we've only got about five minutes on this. So. Um, uh, First of all, what's what's the size of the the AWS team at the moment that so works that's specifically working on this area? Yeah, yeah. So principally, there's myself and my brother, which is two, um, and then we we have emphasis on an outsource model and have built some very good relationships for it. So we have very good relationships with uh, naval architects, with uh, engineers, composite engineers. Um, and also have built um, global relationships with critical suppliers. So, for example, Quantum Styles um, is a, a membrane supplier for our wings, um, a relationship which, we, which was developed through the last America's Cup campaign. So surrounding yourself with experts? We have to. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, it, it's... It's a little bit, it's driven by uh, limited capital. 
Mm. Um, and we'd love to be able to expand and have a room full of people working on this stuff. But uh, as, I, as I discussed earlier, that requires some money. <laughs> Well, hopefully that will be changing soon. Um, how did you personally get into the the, the sailing fraternity and then into this uh, this commercial uh, shipping aspect of AWS? Okay, so into sailing, um, my first recollection of sailing was having a life jacket shoved on me and being pushed into the under the front uh, deck of a fourteen foot dinghy while my parents went racing. Um, so from an early age yeah yeah my, myself and my brother have sailed all our lives we i had we had our first boat when we were sort of six and seven and <laughs> um we've grown up with with boats ever since and um i, I then moved into ocean racing sailing etchels um etc cetera, etc cetera. um in terms of the the wind sail um design my brother came up with this concept um, in the early 80s um, and sitting around the kitchen table of his house, he said, what do you think of this? And I probably foolishly at the time said, I think we can make this work. <laughs> so here we are three decades later. Dot, 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 dot. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly, yeah. Uh, and, okay, talking about that, yeah, I mean, you've been, you've been, you've been around this for quite a while. What, What's the most difficult issue or the most difficult question that you've had to deal with with wind propulsion technologies for commercializing that? Well, other than the one we've already discussed, which is, seems to be a lack of understanding of the energy that's available, um, the one of the issues we find is that is the, the moment you put a wing in front of someone, they assume it's going to be more complex than their sail. Uh, and so there's this, this really, there's this uh, idea that the whole thing is really complex and it's going to be too difficult to operate and therefore you need to stay away from it. Mm. Um, the yachting and shipping are both actually quite conservative environments. You know, we, we kind of like to say that the last real innovation in yacht sail technology was in 1930. <laughs> um, yeah, when when we went to sloop rigs. Um, you know, what we've seen in the last America's, you know, last few America's Cups, I think, has raised the uh, awareness of it. But I still think that there's a very, very poor understanding of the benefits that a good wing sail can give you over uh, any sort of conventional um, sail technology. And, and I'm assuming probably the, 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 ultimate, the ultimate way of dealing with that is to have more vessels out there operating with the system. Yeah, and, and that's really what our path has been. We, mm. yeah, we were struggling a few years ago to sort of break into the market because the, because the market is so conservative and, and also protected by sentinels. Um, and we identified this cruising catamaran market as a good market for a number of reasons. It's, it's, their vessels have some scale, so you're not dealing with small, light vessels. So the moment that you're pushing a, a wing around on a, an eight-ton or ten-ton vessel, it, it has to have some substance to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, there's a little bit less of the uh, preconceived ideas held by the customer base in, in the catamaran market. Um, that's not to say that it's an easy task. We're, we're still running into resistance and barriers. Right, right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, final question for you. Uh, what are the next steps? You, you arrive at La, La Rochelle, beautiful, beautiful, uh, beautiful town on the, on the west coast of France. Um, after a couple of glasses of uh, well, well-deserved champagne, I'm sure. Uh, what are your next steps? So we, we've got a pretty intensive campaign for the vessel that this rig has gone on to um, over the next 12 months, um, actually before it gets delivered to its, to its final owner. Um, and so we've got, we already have significant interest out of a number of catamaran builders um, 
as I said, we've got about six orders now for this system. Um, and we're expecting that to grow pretty quickly. So our focus, our next steps are going to be focused on uh, presenting, um, demonstrating that rig into that industry, but then also using that background and those demonstration platforms as a step into that um, general cargo, small inter-island cargo uh, market and actively campaign in that market um, for either retrofits to vessels or to new vessels. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, Greg, I'm uh, wishing you all the best on that. And I'm going to give you uh, the, if you like, the final, not quite the final say, but the final say, uh, just a minute to just summarize and give the audience, uh, uh, you know, a, a little bit of a takeaway from, from everything that we've talked about today. Uh, so I'll hand that over to you. Off you go, Greg. Yeah, so uh, look, I think in summary, you know, we're, a, we're a small company. We've, we've come from roots in sailing. Um, we're passionate about decarbonisation of the shipping industry and have quite a lot of experience in that industry amongst the, the members of, you know, ourselves and the members of our team. Um, breaking into any market, any new market is, is a difficult task. We've chosen to go down the leisure path to grow some scale in the, in the business, but we're always open to uh, looking at accelerating that process if we can bring the right partners on from a technical, operational and financial perspective. Fantastic. Well, Greg, uh, thank you so much for joining us, taking some time out early in the morning uh, from your busy schedule over there and um good luck with all the preparations for the for that for that ocean voyage and i'm really excited to to see new developments i'm going to have you back in in six months or nine months time and see what what the progress has been so thanks very much greg thank you for your time gavin no more than more than happy and uh just a, a quick message to the to the viewers you know, really appreciate you coming and uh, joining us at Listening to the Wind. We will have another interview next week. So fair winds to all. Please stay safe. Please stay well and see you in a week's time. Goodbye.